Okay, I um, want to go ahead and get started. Um, I'm going to try to finish up chapter four today, and uh, then, as I've said several times, we'll have a practice exam on uh, Monday. You'll all get copies of that, and we'll go through it. Um, and then the exam is Wednesday. Make sure that when you come to the exam, you bring a number two pencil. Okay, must be number two. Um, number two leads and mechanical pencils usually work, but we've had some funny problems with uh, with mechanical pencils and the leads in them. So it might be easier just to buy a number two pencil for like a quarter in the bookstore and bring it in. Um, also, uh, on the Scantrons, um, the machine does not like erase marks very well because it gets confused. Okay, so if you have a lot of erase marks on your Scantron, you might want to get a new form and fill it out. Okay, and then and surrender your old form so I can dispose of it properly. Um, that's just for your protection because if it turns out that the machine makes a mistake in scoring your exam and you've got erase marks, I can't rescore it because you've got erase marks, and I can't be sure that when those erase marks were made. Okay? So I have to be anal retentive about that, and I'll remind you of that next week. Um, okay, so we, we looked at the endomembrane system. There was a lot involved there. The nucleus, which was the control center of the cell, the rough endoplasmic reticulum, which received proteins for export to other locations, the smooth ER, which packaged those and sent them to the Golgi, and the Golgi apparatus, which sorted everything modified it, and sent it to its final destination. Um, along with that were a number of different vesicles and vacuoles in the cell that are produced by those uh, endomembrane components that are doing various functions like lysosomes, which are digesting components, uh, worn out components in the cell. Um, the second category of organelles then are energy uh, producing or modifying organelles. These are organelles that um, convert, say, light energy to chemical energy or one form of chemical energy to another form of chemical energy for the cell. Um, and they include the chloroplast and the mitochondrion. Plants and animals, in fact, all uh, eukaryotes have or at one time had mitochondria. Um, you may see in some books indications that some protists don't have mitochondria. We found that in every one of those we've examined, they have little vestigial remnants of mitochondria. So they've simply lost them rather than never having had them. Um, and then in addition, plants and some protists have chloroplasts, which are the organelles that are involved in capturing light energy and converting, converting it to chemical energy. Um, they use a number of pigments. I mean, chlorophyll is the one that you always hear about. There are several different forms of chlorophyll, depending on the critter that you're looking at. And um, there are a number of other pigments that also are involved in gathering and capturing light energy. Okay, and when we uh, get into chapter seven, I think it is, we'll be looking at that in detail. <coughs> Right. Um, the architecture is fairly complicated in this organelle. There's three separate compartments, and they're all defined by separate membranes. Okay. Um, it's more complicated than the mitochondrion, as we'll see. Right. And when we look at the picture of this thing, you're going to see stacks of membranes in the middle of the, of the structure. And those are the sites where the energy conversion is actually occurring, where the light energy is being captured, converted into chemical energy, and then stored for later use. All right, so here is um, a mitochond I mean a uh, chloroplast. Okay, we've got a diagram of it on the left, and on the right of this figure we have a uh, uh, transmission electron micrograph of a chloroplast. It's a cross section through a chloroplast. Um, <coughs> there are several compartments in this. There's an outer membrane surrounding the structure. There is an inner membrane underneath that, and so there's a space in between called the intermembrane space, and that's a separate compartment in the cell. Okay. Um, the inner membrane then defines this sort of fluid-filled um, compartment on the inside called the stroma. Okay. It's a little bit easier to see on this uh, TEM image. Okay. That stroma is that fluid-filled area in between, so all this stuff in here 
is stroma. It's very difficult to see the distinction between the outer and inner membranes, however, on this uh, electron micrograph. There's a couple of reasons for that. One of the reasons might be that those membranes tend to shrink a little bit as you, you uh, prepare them for electron microscopy. And also, they're very, very thin. And so it, it's very difficult to see uh, a distinct space between them, but it is there. Okay, um, there is a, another third internal compartment that's defined by these little disks of membrane. Each little disk is called a thylakoid, and I've got that term written down here. Um, and the, uh, I'll go ahead and show these compartments. Okay, thylakoid, that's each one of these little disks. The stacks of disks are called grana, or singular granum. All right, so keep that distinction in mind. Each disk is a thylakoid. The stacks of disks are called grana. Okay? There are, as I said, three compartments in the chloroplast, the intermembrane space, um, the stroma, and the thylakoid space, that space in the middle of each of those disks. Okay? Different processes can occur within those compartments. It's the same idea as a eukaryotic cell compartmenting various pr uh, processes in the cell. The reason a cell puts digestive properties in the lysosome is because if those things were happening in the cytoplasm, that cell would digest itself. So you, the cell protects itself from those damaging processes by having a separate compartment where they happen. Okay, so you can, you can do much more in a cell or in an organelle if you have several separated compartments. Right, and that's true of the chloroplast. Okay, mitochondria are the other energy conversion um, organelle in cells. As I said, all eukaryotic cells have mitochondria. Um, they're a little bit less complicated than the chloroplast. There's only two compartments instead of three. Right, so both plants and animals, indeed all eukaryotes, have mitochondria. Um, it's the site of chemical energy conversion in the cell. Um, <clears throat> those cells that don't do photosynthesis have to take energy sources from one particular source and convert those into an energy source that they can use. Okay? So that's what's happening in the mitochondria, and there's energy conversion going on, primarily of um, glucose as the starting point. Right? Its architecture is simpler. There's only two compartments instead of three, as we see here. Okay, again, we have a uh, diagram of the mitochondrion and then a transmission electron micrograph of a mitochondrion. Not all mitochondria are elongated like this, although most are. Um, some cells in uh, various species will actually have mitochondria that are sort of circular or uh, ellipsoid or oval instead of long structures like this. Um, there is an outer membrane and an inner membrane. Okay, so there's two membranes in this thing, and they form two distinct compartments. There's an intermembrane space, okay, so there's one of the compartments. And then inside the inner membrane is this fluid-filled space called the matrix of the mitochondrion. Okay, that's where a lot of the energy conversion is occurring, but uh, some of it also occurs actually in this inner membrane. Right, so both of those areas are sites for energy conversion and usage. <coughs> the uh, folds in this mitochondrion are called Christi. And those simply increase surface area. You can see them in this uh, transmission electron micrograph pretty clearly. Right? <coughs> um, you'll see occasional little black dots in this mitochondrion. Those are ribosomes. Mitochondria and chloroplasts have their own ribosomes for making their own proteins. Okay. So lots of dramatic internal folding. It increases surface area so you can do more energy conversion. The more surface area you've got in that inner membrane, the more energy can be converted. All right, so that's advantageous. All right, so as I said, not all mitochondria are elongated. In some cells, they're ovals or spheres. Okay. Um, <coughs> mitochondria and chloroplasts have their own circular DNA. Remember I said prokaryotes have a circular DNA molecule? 
right? So do mitochondria and chloroplasts. Uh, mitochondria and chloroplasts have their own ribosomes. Those ribosomes are very much like bacterial ribosomes. Um, the proteins that are produced by the mitochondrion and the chloroplast are like, much more like bacterial proteins than they are like eukaryotic proteins. All of this indicates that these organelles arose as stowaways. Um, we call them endosymbionts. You don't have to remember that term yet. Um, endosymbionts are uh, organisms that live inside other organisms. All right. So they probably arose originally as parasites of early eukaryotic cells, but they f it was advantageous to both kinds of cells for them to be there. So they stuck around. Yeah. Um, are or the, 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 the different kinds of structures, are, are, they, are, the, are they still set up the same? Do, like for, for spheres and for... Oh, I see. Um, the question is, for the different shapes of mitochondria, are they still um, uh, set up the same? Do they still have the circular DNA, the bacterial-like ribosomes? Yes, they do. Yes. It's, a, it's simply a variation in, in the shape of the, the actual mitochondria, rather than a variation in the sort of molecular characteristics. Yeah. Okay, so it's pretty clear now that the that the mitochondria and chloroplasts arose as bacterial stowaways in early eukaryotic cells during the evolution of cells. All right, that's the only reasonable explanation for the fact that they are so bacterial-like. All right, the cytoskeleton. This is a support structure for the cell. Okay? It also provides movement. Um, a number of proteins involved in the cytoskeleton are also involved in movement. Primarily the proteins actin and myosin, which we'll talk about, um, you know, third term when we get into uh, uh, muscles. All right, so the components. Um, there's three different components to the cytoskeleton. Microfilaments, which are made up of a protein called actin. Um, those provide movement and the ability for cells to change shape. Okay? It was a mystery for a long time how cells actually crawled around on a surface. Uh, amoebas, for example. How is it that they can crawl and move? Um, it turns out that they change the shape of that actin, those actin filaments, and there, thereby are able to push themselves forward. Okay? Our cells do that, too. When white blood cells are, are moving through tissues to the site of an infection, they do the same thing. They modify those actin filaments, uh, changing their shape, changing their physical characteristics and they're able to move because of that. It's really kind of neat. Um, intermediate filaments are basically stress preventers. They are um, structures that sort of look like steel cables <laughs> with proteins wrapped around each other, just like a steel cable is wrapped. And those provide structural support for the cell. And the third component is microtubules. And microtubules are really important because they for sort of form the um, transport pathway for the cell. Vesicles that are moving around in the cell in the endomembrane system don't just uh, move randomly. They actually have proteins in their surface that make them crawl along microtubules. All right, so the microtubules are really the railway system for the cell. Um, and that's how these vesicles can be delivered to their particular targets. And they also provide anchorage for cells. They're involved in cell division, so they're really important structures. All right, so here's a graphic representation. This um, scanning uh, uh, electron, they say, it, well, they say transmission, but it looks more like a scanning electron micrograph. Um, that's been produced by simply using acid to etch away the cytoplasm of the cell, leaving the cytoskeleton behind, and so they were simply able to stain it and take a picture of it. Um, the filaments of different sizes are all easily seen here. These smallest ones are actin filaments. Okay, so this is a microfilament. Um, they're fairly small, seven nanometers in diameter. Um, each one of these little balls is an actin uh, protein molecule, and so that actin is simply arranged in chains and then two chains are wrapped around each other to form a wrapped cable. Um, you find this, this 
acting mostly at the edge of the cell, close to the, um, the cell membrane. You don't find as much of it farther in towards the center of the cell. Intermediate filaments are found all over the place. Um, you can see how these look like wrapped steel cables, and the idea is the same. They provide structural integrity and structural support for the cell. They're a little bit heftier at uh, 10 nanometers in uh, diameter. The largest ones that we find in the cytoskeleton, however, are these microtubules over here on the right. And they're made up of a subunit of proteins called tubulin. They're 25 nanometers in diameter, and they are hollow. Okay? So um, if you were looking at this structure end on, you'd see that it had a hollow space in the middle of it. That's why we call them microtubules. Okay? They really are tubes. Uh, microtubules and actin filaments provide another very important function for the cell. They provide movement. Uh, and that's achieved by these structures, cilia and flagella. Okay, so they allow cells to swim through a fluid medium. Um, protists are single-celled protists are able to use cilia and flagella to swim in their environment. Um, we have cells that have cilia and flagella. The cells lining our respiratory tract, for example, have cilia to push uh, foreign materials back up and out of the respiratory tract. Okay. Um, smokers don't have those. They burn them off. And so that's why they cough a lot. It's the only way to get all that crap out of their lungs. Um, we have cells with flagella as well. Sperm cells have a flagella. Okay. <clears throat> so inhaled particles are moved out of the lungs by waves of cilia. There are other uh, places in our, in our bodies where cells have um, cilia. Okay. Anywhere you have to have movement of substances, uh, mucus sheets, all that kind of stuff, you'll find ciliated cells. Um, cilia are actually a fairly simple structure. They have a whole bunch of actin filaments that extend into the cilium, and those actin filaments are simply able to wave back and forth, and you get these nice controlled waves of cilia um, movement across the surface of the cell, and that propels them in one direction. Uh, flagella work in a similar way. This is a flagellum, and it's a much more complicated structure. It's made up of microtubules. Okay, so here we see the di on the left, we see the diagrammatic representation of it. Um, we've got doublets of microtubules that are connected to each other by these little proteins sticking out. Okay, so they're all able to interact with each other. And then there are central, two central microtubules. If we were to look at this edge on, this is what we'd see. Um, there's outer microtubule doublets or pairs, central microtubules, and then these radial elements or spokes that extend from the center out to the edge. Those are um, sort of helping to maintain the round or circular shape of this thing. They're surrounded by plasma membranes. So the, the um, cell membrane just extends out to cover the whole surface of the flagellum. It's never, there's no part of it that's exposed to the environment. <coughs> Okay. The flagellum itself, if we look at electron micrograph, you really do see all these structures. Here's the microtubule doublets. Here are the arms that are extending out to uh, interconnect with other doublets. Right? So here's two arms right here. Here's two more up here at the top. Um, it's a little difficult to see the spoke elements, but you can sort of see them. There's one right there, one right here, and the remnants of one over here. Okay, and then the two central microtubules. Right, the basal body is basically a support structure for the flagellum. It provides a base that the flagellum is able to um, whip or rotate or move against. And the basal body, notice, has a much different structure. It has microtubule triplets. So there's three microtubules connected for each of these triplets. And there's no central microtubules. But there are radial elements. They're actually a little bit easier to see in here. Okay? So you can see all these radial elements extending from the center of this thing out to the edge.
Okay. How does this thing work? Well, basically, the flagellum bends. And when it bends, because it's a long structure, the, the end of it whips around as it comes back. Okay. So it's sort of like this kind of motion where it's bending, whipping the top part of it back around. <coughs> Excuse me. And that creates a force that um, provides movement. It does it because this little, um, these little wing proteins sticking out, dynein they're called, um, can actually bind to and interact with microtubules or tubulin protein. When you add energy in the form of ATP, we haven't talked much about ATP yet. When you add energy, what happens is you get a sliding force. The dynein arms simply extend up and pull against the microtubules okay, that they're in contact with. And because the microtubules are held at the base, okay, um, that means that instead of sliding, they bend. So that's what's happening here. These microtubules are actually bending. Right? And that bends the entire flagellum. If they weren't connected a, uh, at the base, what would happen is you'd simply get sliding of the, these microtubules against each other, and that would dissipate that bending force. Okay, um, cells have to talk to each other. They have to communicate with each other. They have to be able to form tissues if you're going to be multicellular. Um, and you have to be able to form a number of um, protein support structures in order to be able to um, maintain contact. Right? Even single-celled organisms have to talk to each other. When um, yeast cells, for example, uh, reproduce, um, you'll get two cells that actually fuse with each other. And in order to be able to find each other, they put out what are called mating pheromones. These little proteins that are detected by uh, other cells, and that, dr that guides the cells into each other so they can fuse. So even single-celled uh, organisms have to be able to communicate with each other. Um, in multicellular organisms, cell junctions allow for local communication between cells. They also allow cells to form sheets that resist tearing. And there are a number of human genetic diseases that result from the inability to form cell junctions correctly. Um, and most of these diseases result in extreme blistering. Um, you know, you think wearing clothes is no big deal, but these people blister if they wear clothes because the clothes rub against their skin, break these cell junctions, and then you get all this fluid that comes in under the skin, so you get blisters. Um, it's pretty sad seeing a little six-month-old kid with this disease and, and, you know, being wrapped completely in gauze except for maybe their face and they got blisters all over their face. It's just, it's sad. It's an incredibly painful disease. And there's nothing we can do about it. All right, so it allows cells to maintain a sturdy contact with each other. The consequences of not being able to are severe. All right. Um, in fact, if these cells can't locally communicate with each other, the consequences can be fairly severe. There's um, hereditary forms of deafness, which are caused by the inability of cells in the inner ear to make these local communications with each other, these local connections. That's the only defect in these cells, and yet it causes hereditary deafness. Um, okay, and they also allow cells to organize into tissues, and that's a hallmark of multicellular life. Uh, multicellular life had to figure out how to organize into specialized tissue groups or cell groups in order to do specialized functions. In plants, there are these structures called plasmodesmata. Okay? Um, and we see them in this diagram up in the top left. Uh, the cell walls of these plant cells are really a huge barrier to cells being able to communicate with each other. Okay. Um, it's very difficult to get stuff to move through the cell wall because there's many layers to the cell wall. There are um, many, many um, um, uh, rods of, um, of, uh, <coughs> of uh, polysaccharide in there. And as a result, you can't get stuff to move through that cell wall effectively. 
So you've got to have a way around that. So cells actually connect with each other by having little holes in the cell wall through which materials can pass. Okay, small molecules, small proteins, ions can pass across these. Larger proteins and larger molecules can't. So cells can share uh, sugar molecules, for example. They can share potassium ions. They can share small proteins, but a protein that has, say, 1,000 amino acids in it is going to be way too big. It's not going to be able to get across. So these cells are able to regulate to a certain extent what actually is crossing these um, plasma desmata. Okay. <coughs> so there's not a whole lot of additional connection that's required for these cells, partly because the cell wall is so tough and so rigid. Right? It's, it's glued, ag these cells are glued against each other, so it's going to be really difficult to pull them apart. On the other hand, animal cells don't have a cell wall, and so they have to have numerous connections in order to maintain their structural integrity. Okay, three of these kinds of connections are shown here. Uh, we see tight junctions up at the top of these cells. Now keep in mind that we're really looking at a cross section of these cells, so this tight junction is not sort of a little spot area, it's actually a belt around the whole top of the cell. Um, by the way, these are cells that are in your um, small intestine, the lining of your small intestine. They have all of those finger-like projections up at the top. It increases surface area for absorbing nutrients. Um, but the, these cells are subjected to a huge amount of stress. When your uh, small intestine contracts to push food through, uh, it's a huge force that they have to fight um, or bear. And so they have all these connections to maintain their coherency. All right, so multiple types of junctions occur in plants or in, in animals. Um, tight junctions shown up here. They seal cells off from these open spaces. Um, you'd be amazed how much junk is in your gut. There's bacteria, um, there's, there's other microorganisms, there's uh, all kinds of garbage that you've eaten. You know, yesterday's Big Mac going through there. And uh, I shouldn't say that. I'm a McDonald's fan myself, but um, so there's all this junk that you don't really want to get into your tissues, and so these tight junctions prevent that from happening. They prevent materials from coming out of this area through these cells and down into this extracellular matrix where it could be a really serious problem. It could contribute to uh, bacterial growth, for example. Right? Um, this tight junction extends as a belt all the way around the top of the cells. And interestingly, it really does look like uh, a threaded structure where you've just taken a uh, thread of protein and you just threaded it through the cells and sewn them together. Okay. Um, there's three major proteins that are involved in those tight junctions, and they've all been pretty well characterized. All right, another thing that these uh, tight junctions do is they define a, a top and a bottom. They define separate domains for these cells. The top of these cells is called the apical domain, and the bottom of these cells is called the basal domain. Those can be functionally and structurally different because they are separated from each other by that tight junction. Okay, so up at the top, up at the apical side of the cells, you can have proteins that are absorbing nutrients. Whereas in the bottom of these cells, you may have proteins that are involved in transporting those nutrients into the bloodstream. Okay, so they can be functionally and structurally distinct. Anchoring junctions are like rivets. <coughs> right, they hold cells together. And these things will be all over the middle portions of these cells. Um, notice the structure. They've got these big disks with intermediate filaments. These are filaments of the cytoskeleton that are extending into the disk and back out. So they're really embedded in the disk. It produces a very, very strong structure. It's going to be hard to tear that thing apart. In addition, you'll see that there are proteins extending out of the cell membrane and interconnecting with each other across these disks. The result of that is that you have a lot of covalent connections between proteins. And if you have a lot of covalent connections, they're very difficult to tear apart. 
Okay, so that's what maintains the connection of these cells to each other. There are also anchoring junctions down at the base, and this figure doesn't show them, but those anchoring junctions are involved in holding the cells onto that basement membrane. Okay, this is um, usually mostly collagen protein. Um, there's some other things in there that make it nice and sturdy. But you'll have anchoring junctions that will hold these cells into this um, basal, uh, basal membrane or extracellular matrix. And finally, we have communicating junctions. And these allow small molecules to pass across. They're a lot like plasmodesmata in plants, except that these can be tightly regulated. Turns out that the, the levels of calcium that are present in the cell can regulate how big the opening is in these communicating junctions. Right. They're very, very complicated. There may be several different kinds of proteins making up these connecting junctions. Different tissues may use different kinds of proteins to make these connecting junctions. That's why you could have a defect in a particular protein for these connecting junctions, and it only affects the inner ear. Okay, because that's, that protein, that particular uh, type of protein, is only used in the, s the cells lining the inner ear and nowhere else. Okay. So they're pretty specialized. Um, again, ions can cross, other small molecules can cross, small proteins can get across, but larger stuff usually is not going to be able to pass across these. If the larger stuff tried to get through, would it actually block? Say that again, please. If the larger molecules were trying to get through, would it actually block? <laughs> Good question. Um, she's asking if the larger molecules try to get through these openings, would they simply get stuck? Would they block the opening? The answer is no. What happens is they come in, they may diffuse or randomly move into the connecting junction, and they hit it, and they simply won't interact with the uh, amino acid side chains that are in there, and so they just sort of bounce off. Yeah, they don't get stuck. Um, I put this picture in just to inspire you with awe. Um, I don't know about you, but I almost became an astronomer. If I could have handled the math, I probably would have, but I'm terrible at math. Um, it just, it boggles my mind when, when you think about how much is out there. I mean, look at this, this picture. Thousands, thousands of stars. Our galaxy has somewhere around 100 million stars, at least. Um, there are millions of galaxies out there in the universe that we can catalog. And they all are um, huge assemblages of stars. They have planets around them. The search for extrasolar planets has yielded incredible fruit. Um, there are a number of stars that we have looked at where we have detected planets around them. So planetary systems like ours form. If you think about it, anywhere that you have chemistry, you have the potential for life to exist because life is almost a consequence of the chemical properties of matter. All right? So when you look out at this kind of a, of a picture and you see um, all of these stars in these big nebulae, these star-forming regions, this is where stars are being born and new, new, st uh, new planetary systems are being produced. All right? You look out there and you think, there's got to be. It's got to be life. Okay. So, you know, the question, does life exist elsewhere in our galaxy, in others? I think the answer is probably inevitably yes. The question is, will we ever be able to find intelligent life in the universe? Okay. Will we ever be able to communicate with that intelligent life? Um, well, Einstein pretty much tells us that's the answer there is no. There are ways around the speed limit of the universe, that is the speed of light, but they're not anything that our technology could handle. We'd have to be way, way more advanced than we are now. Um, I don't know about you, but every time I look up in the night sky, it's just this sense of awe and wonder. You know, wondering, is there life out there? What is it like? It's just, it's cool to think about. Okay. Um, 
Are there any questions? All right, so the exam will cover the notes up to this point, chapters one through four. We'll go through a practice exam on Monday and then take the exam on Wednesday. And have a good weekend.